featuring professor and family counselor Teresa Davis. I love Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, and something that I noticed in August, the August dates that had a theme an unword. Here are some of them, and then I'll go over them specifically. The first one, unconscious, unaffected loveliness, unutterable unworthiness, unutterably humble, unutterably pure, undisturbedness of the Lord, unutterable trust in God, unsullied walking, unsullied talking, and unsullied thinking. So reading over the dates, those dates in August, I began to notice that theme and I thought that might be a good thing to sort of map out. But I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to go back to April, April 29th. If you like uh, most uh, uh, Oswald's utmost, that's what I call, I call them Oswald. Most authors that I really like, I call them by their first name. I feel like I know them, so call them Oswald. That's probably a little disrespectful. However, Oswald's April 29th uh, entry, I kind of went back a little bit because it's a good way for me to introduce the theme. Uh, the title in each of his entries, of you probably know, have um, verses that he bases it on. Um, and this one was titled that day. It might have been my title. I'm not sure. If you look at the title, it might be a little, little bit different. But Gracious Uncertainty. The scripture verse was 1 John 3, verse 2. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We cannot presume to see ourselves in any circumstance in which we have never been. Certainty is the mark of the common sense life. Gracious uncertainty is the mark of the spiritual life. Gracious uncertainty. The spiritual life is the life of a child. We are not uncertain of God, but uncertain of what he is going to do next. If our certainty is only in our beliefs, we develop a sense of self-righteousness, become overly critical, and are limited by the view that our beliefs are complete and settled. But when we have the right relationship with God, life is full of spontaneous, joyful uncertainty and expectancy. Jesus said, believe also in me, John 14, 1, not believe certain things about me. Leave everything to him, and it will be gloriously and graciously uncertain how he will come in. But you can be certain that he will come in. Remain loyal to him. Um, you'll pardon me if some of my teaching thoughts come back because I think they pertain here. I have noticed um, among students, and I also remember myself just learning about the counseling uh, you know, the counseling skills that I was to use in the counseling room, but I also can remember my utter, another another U word, utter terror the first time I had a client come into my room. I can see her. I wish I could find her. I would apologize to her. I hope I didn't do anything bad. I, my, my intent was good. Uh, but I have, rem I remember that, and so when I'm teaching uh, students, I will say to them, learn the skills. I think I've even mentioned this before. Learn the skills and then put the pressure on the people. Put the pressure on the people and let the Holy Spirit work on them and bring the people to you. On the other side of that, I will also talk with students about not uh, limiting their own imaginations to what can happen in the counseling room. Because if we do that, we are kind of shutting out the possibility of um, the gracious uncertainty. So we, um, I guess, what I want to say about that particular ent uh, entry in, in his uh, uh, devotional is that we need to be open to uh, maybe why God has put certain things into our hands and what it is that he has called us to do. And maybe to be aware, as, as I think maybe I was this morning, that when there is a gap and you are able to fill in and do something you know how to do it, um, speak up and say something about that. So now we'll move into um, the uncertainties or the uns in August. 
And again, I'm going to cheat a little bit because the last one is actually September 1st. I couldn't resist. So I'm going to use my Oswald book here. And there are some things that I'll, that I'll read to kind of get our minds going. Uh, my class, we didn't start James this morning, so we'll be doing that next week. But my little uh, class that I have were so good to sit and listen um, to me do out loud prep. I've never done out loud prep before, so they were very, very kind to me and let me kind of go over some of these things. So let's see how this works. The first date will be August 21st, and I will read the scripture verses. I have a classic version of Oswald, so it will be the King James Version that I'll be reading for each of the entries. August 21st, the, uh, the subject or the topic, uh, scripture verse was Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So I'll just read you a little bit of what Oswald says. At the basis of Christ's kingdom is the unaffected loveliness of the commonplace. The unaffected loveliness of the commonplace. The true character of the loveliness that tells for God is always unconscious. Which are the people who have influenced us most? Not the ones who thought they did, but those who had not the remotest notion that they were influencing us. In the Christian life, the implicit is never conscious. It is the conscious, it, if it is conscious, it ceases to have this unaffected loveliness, which is the characteristic of the touch of Jesus. We always know when Jesus is at work because he produces in the commonplace something that is inspiring. Now that says a lot, it says a lot to me, but one of the things that it does for me is to help me be expectant and excited about what God will bring into any situation, even the most difficult ones. Unaffected loveliness. The next date is August 22nd, and the scripture verse for that date is Matthew 3, 11. Jesus says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Repentance does not bring a sense of sin, but a sense of unutterable unworthiness. Unutterable unworthiness. When I repent, I realize that I am utterly helpless. I know all through me that I am not worthy even to bear his shoes. I indeed was this and that, but he came and a marvelous thing happened. Get to the margin where he does everything. I brought a card and I can't. I got a card in the mail this week and I think that was one of the things that somehow floated around into a different location. I'll keep thumbing through here just in case. But I got a card this week uh, from someone uh, who listens to the to listens to the uh, sermons on the on the website, and also um, is a client of mine. And so um, she sent me a beautiful card, and on the front it said something about um, decisiveness and um, repentance. Uh, the, the result or holiness is the result of a sound repentance and the ability of our minds to, to be decisive. And so that was sort of what we were going to talk about today in James. So I'm trying to, to pull all the materials together. But uh, that was just so appropriate, just so appropriate. But that's August 22nd. The next one is August 25th. And the scripture verse for that day is John 15, 15. I have called you friends. I have called you friends. It is a friendship based on the new life created in us, which has no affinity with our old life, but only with the life of God. And here is the un. It is unutterably humble, unsullidly pure, and absolutely devoted to God. Unutterably humble, unsullidly pure, and absolutely devoted to God. And that's a friendship. Uh, one of my favorite authors is um, Elizabeth Googe, and she wrote a book. I can't remember the name of the book. It's a trilogy, 
uh, but she said something like, um, it is a delightful thing to have someone in your life who is totally for you, totally for you. And I think that's one of the things that marriage can be, but that's certainly what is talked about here in our relationship with God. That kind of friendship kind of brings a new meaning and a fuller meaning uh, to the idea of friends. The next one is August 26th, and the scripture verse is John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. And I, I have put down here also, let not be troubled your heart. That's um, the ver verse 14, 1. Are you painfully disturbed just now? Distracted by the waves and billows of God's providential permission? And having, as it were, turned over the boulders of your belief, are you still finding no well of peace or joy or comfort? Is all barren? Then look up and receive the undisturbedness of the Lord Jesus. Are you looking unto Jesus now in the immediate matter that is pressing and receiving from him peace? I can tell you that I'm working on that. Lay it all out before him, and in the face of difficulty, bereavement, and sorrow, hear him say, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. I like it that he gives the peace twice. The next one is on August 29th. The scripture verse for that day is John chapter 11, verse 40. Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God? Every time you venture out in the life of faith, you will find something in your common sense circumstances that flatly contradicts your faith. Faith must be tested because it can be turned into a personal possession only through conflict. What is your faith up against just now? The test will either prove that your faith is right or it will kill it. Blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. And that's one of the themes I think that Tim is talking about in his messages, not being ashamed of the gospel. The final thing is confidence in Jesus. Believe steadfastly on him, and all you come up against will develop your faith. There is continual testing in the life of faith, and the last great test is death. May God keep us in fighting trim, exclamation point. Faith is unutterable trust in God, trust which never dreams that he will not stand by us. So he is a friend who is utterly, utterly um, for us, so we can have an unutterable trust in him. The next one is August 31st. You can see we're approaching the end of the month. Uh, the verse here is John 15, verse 11. That my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And Oswald comments, Be rightly related to God, find your joy there, and out of you will flow rivers of living water. Be a center for Jesus Christ to pour living water through the life that is rightly related to God is as natural as breathing wherever it goes. The lives that have been of most blessing to you are those who were unconscious of it. And I shared with my class, and I wish I had this in my, in my memory. I love to memorize poems. It's like cool to have poems. Always, you've always got a poem in your pocket. Um, we talked about John Adams this morning, so Abigail comes to mind. Abigail had a lot of memorized poems, and you could tell because all of her writings would have poems with just a few words wrong, so they were coming from her memory, and it was how she put them in her memory. Um, but we talked uh, in, this morning about a poem that I remembered. I don't have it memorized like Abigail does, but it's called uh, Variation on the Word Sleep, and it's by Margaret Atwater. 
It's a lovely, lovely, lovely poem. And it starts out by um, uh, a loved one wanting to watch their partner sleep. And the first line is, I would love to watch you sleeping, which may not happen. And uh, I, I uh, have even uh, just recently recorded in my journal a time when I watched my husband sleeping and was glad to have him. Uh, so there's just, uh, that poem is a beautiful poem and it talks about that, uh, that fact of, um, you know, wanting to, to just kind of be with someone in that kind of unconscious way. And it ends up by saying um, the, the one uh, who has the loved one that they are watching, um, and I'm paraphrasing this, I want to be amazing to you as the air you breathe, and that unnecessary. I want to be as necessary to you as the air you breathe, and that unnecessary. And that, excuse me, I'm going to try that again. I've written it in light pencil, so I'm going to do it better. I want to be as necessary to you as the air you breathe, and that unnoticed. Better? Much better, right? Much better. So then I have to read that one again. I want to be as necessary to you as the air you breathe, and that unnoticed. So I like that, and I think that's what is being talked about here as far as our... Um, uh, Keith was talking about that this morning in our class, that when we do things uh, purely in the spirit, we aren't even recognizing that we're doing it. So um, we are unnoticed in a sense. And I think that's the theme that we're talking about here. So as I mentioned, I'm going to um, cheat a little and go into September 1st, because uh, I thought I was done when I typed out all of my uns, uh, but I realized I wasn't because September 1st has a lovely series of uns. The scripture verse is 1 Peter 1, 16. Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. God has one destined end for mankind, holiness. His one aim is the production of saints. He did not come to save men out of pity, he came to save men because he had created them to be holy. The atonement means that God can put me back into perfect union with himself without a shadow between through the death of Jesus Christ. Never tolerate through sympathy with yourself or with others any practice that is not in keeping with the holy God. Holiness means unsullied walking with the feet unsullied talking with the tongue, unsullied thinking with the mind, every detail of the life under the scrutiny of God. Holiness is not only what God gives me, but what I manifest that God has given me. So that's a, sort of a charge to me, maybe it is to all of you, unsullied walking with the feet, unsullied thinking with the mind, unsullied talking with the tongue. So, and now is the time for Becky. Now is Becky's turn. She was going to help me with something. The scoffers. Do you happen to have the little sheet that I gave you? Okay, because I didn't bring mine. I, I thought it would be a good ending to um, talk to end with the, the beautiful, beautiful doxology at the end of the book of Jude because um, it talks about um, Let's see, how does he introduce it? Well, I will read that in a few minutes, but here's what I'll do first. This is what happens when you prepare while you're brushing your teeth. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. 
Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. We talked about that last group of people for a little while in our uh, time together in, on Sunday morning last week, because that can be sometimes misconstrued to mean there are some people we say, uh-uh, not having anything to do with you, you are too far gone. And that not, is not at all what it says. There are three different um, kinds of uh, believers who are following the scoffers, those who don't have the spirit, those who are causing division among the brethren. The first group um, is those who are wavering, those who are wavering. You can sort of uh, tell who they are. The next group are those who are already in the fire, and that's where we are snatchers. I explain to students sometimes that we are training to be professional snatchers, professional snatchers. But that third group is the group that sometimes gives us um, uh, kind of a false sense of being able to turn away from someone. We are to show mercy with great care to others who have fallen into deep sin. And it's sometimes uh, the commentary that I used for that part of the scripture talked about those people are so deep into their sin and so deep in the, into their thinking that is far, far away from the ways of God that it is almost like they have an infection because sometimes that can be so uh, contagious that if we become near, we've come near it, we need to be very careful. And that's why I think Jude says to avoid touching even the garment that has touched their skin. But it doesn't mean that we don't uh, work with them and try to help them. So those three things are show mercy to those who are wavering, snatch others who are already in the fire, and show mercy with great care to others who have fallen into deep sin. Uh, but that's what we are to do. The first part of that that we studied downstairs was how do we do that? How do we get ready to do that? I would like to know that. According to Jude, here are the things believers must do in order to prepare themselves to withstand the opposition of the scoffers, the unbelievers who do not have the Spirit, capital S, and who are causing division among the brethren. First, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Two, Pray in the Holy Spirit, and we talked a great deal about these. Three, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And four, my favorite, wait patiently for the mercy which will come when Jesus is revealed. Do you not see that? As, those are really four good things to do. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, wait patiently for the mercy which will come when Jesus is revealed. And then just after that, thank you, Becky, just after that comes in Jude, one of the loveliest doxologies in all of scripture. And one thing I like about it, which pertains to the topic for today, is that there is a word here uh, that we usually say, it starts out now, to him who is able to protect you from stumbling. Uh, there is one Greek word to represent protect you from stumbling, and that word actually means unstumbling. So in a sense, what we are told to do is to practice unstumbling. So that's a good un word for us to, to end here today. Verse 24 and 25, the lovely doxology in Jude's letter. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling or to keep you walking in an unstumbling way and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. 
Amen. Now, I thought um, at the end, that's um, my material, and we talked a little bit in the Sunday school class this morning that it was, there were some things in there that were convicting or not convicting. What's the word, Dwayne? Thought provoking, challenging. challenging. Um, so is there any one of those, and it's all right if, if, if it doesn't uh, work out that way in your mind, but are there any one of those uns that specifically spoke to you? I'm sad that Kay isn't here this morning, Dan, because he, she would have loved the Oswald focus. Are there any of those? And let me just read uh, just the on words, and we won't spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to ask, in case there were any gaps, that the Lord has pressed something in your hand uh, for today. The true character of the loveliness that tells for God is always unconscious. Repentance does not bring a sense of sin, but a sense of unutterable unworthiness. Unutterable unworthiness. I indeed was this and that, but he came and a marvelous thing happened. Get to the margin where he does everything. I'm just reading briefly from these dates. Um, it is a friendship, August 25th. The friendship is based on the new life created in us, which has no affinity with our old life, but only with the life of God. It is unutterably humble, unsullidly pure, and absolutely devoted to God. The next one, they look up and receive the undisturbedness of the Lord Jesus. Lay it all out before him, and in the face of difficulty, bereavement, and sorrow, hear him say, let your heart not be troubled. May God keep us in fighting trim, exclamation point. Faith is unutterable trust in God, trust which never dreams that he will not stand by us. The lives that have been of most blessing to you are those who are unconscious of it. The last one, holiness means unsullied walking with the feet, unsullied talking with the tongue, unsullied thinking with the mind, every detail of the life under the scrutiny of God.